Well, it's paper doll time again. I know you're excited about this. Here's the writer. I'm not going to talk about him. He can be right there. There's the calligrapher. I don't need to talk to him. To... Where did the collector go? Well, there's a collector here. There he is. Here's the collector. I don't want to talk to him. So these people are going to over here and they're going to have a little menage a trois. Well, not a menage a trois. They're just going to be chatting over there. But I'm going to talk to the artist and um, show a sort of pen that would be great for them. Um, the One of the things about fountain pens that everyone, this is every fountain pen, not just the pens for an artist, but a pen for anyone, pens that were made before 1950, before the ballpoint era, Everyone used a fountain pen. Everyone knew the fountain pen rules. And one of the rules is you don't gesticulate when you are when you have a pen in your hand because if you do, you're going to have that happen. See? The reason that that happens is there's ink at the front of the pen. And the ink supply, the ink flow, allows you to get this very wide line. You can't do it if the feed were, the feed is the thing underneath here, the ink supply, the ink channel, and the feed did not have ink right there. You couldn't make this thick line. So modern fountain pens, after 1950, when the ballpoint came in and these fountain pens almost got extinct, um, fountain pens manufacturers these days are selling pens to people that don't know the rules of fountain pen. So you can get, buy a brand new fountain pen for hundreds of dollars at the brand new fountain pen store and you can load it up with ink and you can shake it like that and nothing will come out and ruin your nice suit. But it also doesn't flow well. You'll find, if, you go, if I go to a fountain, a modern pen store, I'll find that the pen, the ink won't keep up with me. It'll start skipping. And it starts skipping because the ink flow is not robust enough. So the first rule for any modern person that's never used a fountain pen, a vintage fountain pen before, is you don't gesticulate. You don't wave your hand around uh, um, willy-nilly because you're going to get little Jackson Pollocky ink splatters everywhere on your suit, on your person next to you at the, on the train station. The, so you just have to be aware that that's going to happen. And once you are aware, you'll know not to do it. You just have to learn not to talk with your hands or put your pen down before you talk with your hands. So, don't gesticulate. Another thing about fountain pens for artists are, I know a lot of pen artists these days also draw with uh, the ink wash or watercolor on top of their pen drawings. Now, it's a, this is sort of a modern invention, um, uh, or not a modern, I mean, people have been doing it ever since there were pen and ink and ink washes, but back in my day, back in the olden times, um, watercolors were done with watercolor. You didn't, quote, cheat by using pens first um, and filling them in later, adding color later. Um, you worked with maybe pencil to lay out your drawing and then you would work with watercolor and leave it at that. Um, pen and ink with ink wash was done, um, not so much for finished work, but for, you know, designs for cartoons for uh, finished murals or paintings. Um, anyway, blah, blah, blah. This isn't meant to be an art history lesson, but the, the first thing to learn ab about is that gesticulation thing. So the ink flow 
needed to make a line that goes from 0 to 60 needs to allow for a lot of ink up there. So just don't shake your pen around a lot. So that's rule number one. Rule number two is uh, the ink, the inks that go in fountain pens um, are meant to be for fountain pen be made for fountain pens. You don't put India ink in a fountain pen and expect it to work. India ink uh, has shellac in it and shellac will dry and cause a nightmare. Um, they did make some pens that were meant to hold the India ink and those are called safety pens and what, what would happen there is you'd fill it with India ink and when you were done you would re turn a little knob at the back and the point would sink into the ink and submerge and you put the cap on and it's, it essentially was, it kept the, the ink flowing because it would never dry out. Um, but I've never really trusted those pens. I'm always afraid they're all going to spill out the bottle of ink. So I tend not to use it. But there are people, there are people and there are inks that uh, ex that have told me that there are, sorry, let me start that sentence again. There are people in the world that have told me that there are inks that work in fountain pens that are also waterproof. I don't know what they are. Maybe people can post what their favorite ones are on this video link and people can figure it out. I'll try, I'll try some out. Um, the, the thicker ink or the ink that is for uh, that are, is waterproof might be a little thicker and may not flow as quickly as ink that's for fountain pens. So, but that's something that you guys will have to try out. So, back to pens. Now, he, this is a pen that I bought on eBay of all places, and it I could see in the fuzzy picture, or I was hoping in the fuzzy picture that I saw on eBay that the nib was going to be good. I knew that it was a Waterman 100-year nib uh, from the 30s or 40s, and I knew that it would work. Um, but I also saw that the pen was missing its clip and missing the back end. These pens were made with this transparent plastic on the top and the bottom of the pen as some sort of design element that was stupid. It was stupid when it was not broken. Uh, it just was a dumb idea. Why make a little transparent end? I don't think it added any value to the pen in terms of aesthetic value. It just looked dumb. And they didn't realize, of course, that nearly a hundred years later, well, 80 years later, that the plastic would disintegrate. So you can find pens like this at pen shows um, that are broken. And you can buy the pens relatively cheaply. This pen, if it weren't broken, would be a couple hundred bucks, probably, if it was in really nice shape, or more. And um, But because it's broken, you can find these, these pens relatively inexpensively. Um, the nib, however, is still valuable, not only to pen collectors, not only to that guy over here, because he wants to put this nib in a pen that he has that's perfect, uh, but it is, this nib is great for an artist, a calligrapher, a writer, and as a tool, this pen is as good as any. You just have to look past the broken bit. So this has a nice sturdy nib. It's great for drawing. And you know, this pen is for sale for 80 bucks. And for $800, you can't buy a new pen that works as well as this one. I'm just telling you. You show me a pen that you can buy at the store today that writes as well as this. And I'll give you 80 bucks. Okay, so that's this one. Um, this
this is a Venus pen, probably from the 50s, the 40s or 50s, 50s probably. And it has a really nice rubbery nib on it as well. And uh, this is a pen that would not interest the collector because it's sort of too second tier for for them. The Venus Pen Company was not considered um, good enough, I guess, for a pen collector to consider. But pen collectors are learning to appreciate these pens as they did the Estabrook and as they did the Skyline and as they did other sort of second tier well, the Skyline is a first tier pen, but it took a, a lot, takes a lot of people to love a Skyline. Anyway, blah blah blah. This is a really nice nib on this pen too. Very rubbery, and it's smooth enough that it can go backwards without a problem. This pen also is in really nice shape. Nothing wrong with it. No teeth marks. No broken ends. No. Nothing. It really works well. So this Venus is 50 bucks. It's not quite as flexible as the Waterman was, but it's really in nice shape. Now, if this were a dinged up version of the Venus, it might be 40 bucks or maybe even 35 bucks. Uh, but because because it's in this, such nice shape, I'm charging 50 for it. Okay. The Skyline that I talked about, Skylines are great pens. Uh, a lot of people don't like them because I think partly because they're kind of common. They made millions of them <clears throat> and pen collectors um, just find them too common, I guess. They, they have really nice nibs. Many of them have really nice flexible nibs. I mean, they, some of the nibs are firm and some are broad and some are inflexible. <clears throat> but when you get a nice flexible skyline point made by the Eversharp people in the 40s, it's really a nice rubbery nib. And I often sell these to artists if I have a skyline because I know too that they can be a little bit rough on them without worry. This pen nib might be a little bit, I might prefer to sell this to the calligrapher than to the artist, only because there's some slight, you know, this could, this could go to either an artist or a calligrapher. I think that both of them would find it of value. And this, because this pen is in really nice shape, this is a little bit more expensive. This is in the $80 realm as well. Here's a little Waterman um, that, let's see what this pen, this might be a good one for a calligrapher. Oh, wow. This has a really fun nib. Um, <clears throat> this, this is, this would be good for either a calligrapher or an artist. It has a really broad, this, this might, this one starts out loud and gets louder, it's sort of Jackie Gleason, you know. Think of Jackie Gleason as a comic. Everything started out loud. Alice to the moon. You know. He was speaking so the deaf person in the last row could hear him. And um, not quite my cup of tea as a for a comedian. I like the whisperers. Anyway, this pen, uh, boy, this is going to use a gallon of ink uh, per drawing. Really, it starts out loud again and gets louder. This this is a good one for an artist. This sort of reminds me of Van Gogh drawings where he used a reed pen. And this one might be better this is good for a drawer, but this might be better suited for a calligrapher who likes using sort of a broad nib pen uh, to to make their lettering. 
it's uh, you know, it's, it's maybe not great for some script, but it would really be fun for a calligrapher for for a, a, a sort of a free flowing um, cursive or uh, chancery curse whatever the, whatever they are. I don't know my alphabets well enough. But it's really quite fun. Uh, so I think I would I would aim this one would go to the calligrapher. Though an artist could do a great job with this. Now this pen, what's wrong with this pen? You ask? Well, it has a little bit of plating wear. You see that chrome trim that this used to have has worn off the clip, or the lever there. So that's gonna, and the ring. So that's gonna make a pen collector not be interested in it, but that doesn't bother me. You should see my plating wear. If you saw me right out of the shower, you'd say, God, that guy has plating wear. Um, look at that lever. Anyway, this one, uh, because of this really nice springy nib, even with the, if this were, if the, if it didn't have plating wear, it didn't have problems, it would be 125 bucks. Uh, but because of its uh, trauma to it, this is another, you know, $80 pen or so. And again, it works better than anything new, no matter how much you pay for it. Okay, let's try to find a pen that's going to be $30. And this, this would be $30, but I'm not sure this would have enough oomph for a... This, this is a good, a good pen for a writer, also for a drawer. I could do drawer. I can do a perfectly good job drawing with this pen. It goes from 0 to 30 instead of 0 to 60 or 0 to 80. It starts out, there's, you know, the thin line is here, the thick line is there. Oh, another thing that people need to learn that they've forgotten is that you can apply pressure to pen nibs. A gold nib can flex, and it's not going to harm the nib. And when I show pens to people and point out that you can do that, they, they sort of jump back in horror, saying, aren't you, gonna, aren't you ruining the pen? And I said, no, not at all. And I give them the pen, and I say, make a line that goes from here to there, and just... So they take the pen in their hand and they press down. And I said, no, press down, press down, press down, press down. And they finally press down. And I say, okay, now stop. And they say, oh, my God, I didn't know that that can happen. And I said, yes, that can happen. You can press down. You can get a thick line um, by applying pressure. So you have to learn to do that. Um, think about this pen as being a number 6B pencil. And those pencil people know what that means. You know, you can you can draw very lightly with the 6B pencil and, and get a broad, probably, but sort of light gray line. And you press down hard and you'll get this jet black line of lead graphite on your paper. So that's... Um, that. I also have, there are some pens that I have that are steel nibbed pens that also have a little bit of flex to them. This is a $15 pen from the Eberhardt Faber Company. These, these pens are every bit as good as an Estabrook. And um, though at the moment pen collectors don't care about them, so I can buy them relatively inexpensively and fix them and you know this has this this pen can go from as nice as that one that I just tried the shaper uh, this was a shaper by the way from the 40s and 50s um, so even this pen I 
I used to, when I was in college, I used to use Rapidograph pens because I didn't know these things existed. And had I known, had I had this pen in college or in high school, I would have been in heaven. Because look at, look at the variety of line I can get with this. And it's a steel nib pen, you know. You can't even find a, a gold nibbed or a steel nibbed modern fountain pen that, that'll probably do, well, I don't know, maybe you can find, find something that can work like that, I don't know. I don't shop for modern pens, I'm afraid. So, anyway, this sort of pen is 15 bucks. Um, let's see, here's another Schaefer. This one... Yeah, this pen has a nice rubbery nib on it as well, and it's a little bit more flexible than the other Schaefer. This would be 40 bucks, And this would be a really good pen to, to hand to someone to as a sort of starter pen. You know, if, if for some reason they end up breaking it, you know, the the pen gods in the sky are not going to weep or put on their black armbands. They'll, they'll say, you know, hang black wreaths on their door. They're not gonna, they're not gonna really be sorry that a Schaefer 33 uh, nib or pen got broken or lost because it's, it's relatively common or whatever. Um, so this is a pen that I might say, okay, try this out for a week. And if you don't like it, if this pillow isn't the best pillow you've ever had, return it for your money back. Um, just pay shipping and handling of $500. Uh, but it's this is a great pen. This would be a pen that I would gladly hand to someone and say, okay, take it around the block a couple of times. I'll call you in a week, and I'm sure you'll want to buy it by that time. I often feel like I am, and this is very un-PC, but I'll say it anyway, what the heck. I always, I often feel like I'm the, the guy selling marijuana at the playground to the kids because I know that they're going to love it and they're going to end up being my best customer for the heroin later on. Um, the, and not that I would ever do that, but if I hand some people, if I hand some people a fountain pen, I know that they're going to be hooked in, in it. They're not going to necessarily become an addict. They're not necessarily going to want to buy another pen from me. But they will really appreciate what this pen does versus what they have been using. So that's the deal. So this pen, because this pen's nib is slightly more fun than the other one, this would be sort of $45. Maybe, you know, let's say 40 And it's really a yummy nib. And I could, I could do perfectly beautiful drawings with this thing. Well, I mean, I could try to, to make perfectly beautiful drawings. One could, an artist, a talented artist, could make a perfectly beautiful drawing with this pen. And I might, I'm an artist, and I might be able to make a perfectly beautiful drawing with this pen, too. But, in fact, what I'll do is I'll include with a with the purchase of a pen I'll do a little drawing I don't know what it will be of but I'll do a drawing with the pen that I send out um, showing you showing the customer what I can do with this pen and you know that'll show you the range of from fine line to to thick line 
uh, I just turned the pen upside down as you can see and, and that's a way that you can, as you know, get a fine line. You can't press down when it's upside down like this, but it is a way that you can sort of move into a different realm. Most pens can do this and you'll see a difference. It's something I no normally don't do uh, just because I, wanna, I don't want to have to make that decision is one of the reasons why I don't really like that those pens that are coming out now that you know have the three different pen nibs and you can by arranging how you hold your pen like this it'll it'll make a different line that's that's more thinking that I want to deal with when I'm drawing it might work well for a calligrapher who sort of thinks differently I think than an artist but um, I don't want to have to think about that. I want to. I want to just draw. Ta-da! Anyway, so that's what these pens are like. I'll um, I'll include my email in the YouTube video commentary. So you folks can email me if you're interested in pens like I've shown or other ones. Um, no two pens are alike. I can't say I've got 20 of these. I have one of these. This is it right here. I have one of those. I have one of those. I have one of those. They're all different. They don't write the same. Um, so I, I'll have a lot of these videos up here. <laughs> pens that are for sale. I can I can sort of suggest s types of pens. You know, there's a pen that does X, Y, and Z. There's a pen that does A, B, and C. And there's a pen that does L, M, and N. And, um, you know, you, you'd, you'd say, okay, I want a class, I want the ABC pen. And I would take a photograph of the pens that do that and say, okay, here's, here's what they are and here's what they cost. And, you know, each of the pens, you know, if I were, if I were to show you five pens that all did the ABC thing, this one might be 30 bucks, this one might be 50 bucks, this one might be $100. And those prices generally if the nibs all are doing the same thing, if every pen in this array did this, wrote more or less like this pen does, the chances are the price difference will have to do with condition and rarity of the pen, the thing that the pen collector is interested in. And um, you just have to understand that, that, you know, there is more than just the nib when it comes to a price of a pen. But I try to, if I'm selling to the artist, where did he go? He's here somewhere covered by, there he is. If I'm selling to the artist or the calligrapher, I try to sell it as inexpensively as I can, or try to offer pens that are as inexpensively as I can, because I know we tend to be poorer than the pen collector. Um, and uh, the, the money, we're, sp we're buying tools of our trade. We're not buying luxury items. The problem is the tools of our trade are expensive. You go to an art supply store today and you walk up and down the aisle and that little tube of blue paint is $30. I haven't bought <clears throat> oil paint in a long time, but I know that back in 30 years ago they were expensive. So I can just imagine what they are now. So, you know, spending 30 to $60 on a fountain pen that will last you for the rest of your life, and if you have children, the rest of their lives, and if you have grandchildren, if they have children, the rest of their lives, 
um, that's pretty. That's a pretty good investment for 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 you, I think, for anyone. So anyway, ta da, ta da. See you later.